He wants to do island inspection or whatever. <laughs> but I, I think it'd be well worth your while to stay awake uh, this afternoon. Uh, Julie will be um, talking about digitization and, and how you can be getting geared up, prepared to do a better job than no, I'm not saying you're not doing a good job, but you know everybody can improve here and there, and and she will have some things to say about things that have worked, things that have not worked. I uh, also want to welcome her act, by the way. She's one of our first-time attendees. I think there's a couple other ones here for the first time. Anyway, um, I hope you will gain something from what this this afternoon and I'll turn time over to Julie. than I have. I'm trying to get there. I'm starting to go to conferences, that type of a thing. But again, I'm not an expert. So if anything that I say you disagree with or have a better idea, I welcome any type of um, response afterwards. Talk to me about it, anything like that. So I, I, I want to learn from you as well. So I really like this quote that I saw on some um, Library of Congress digit digitization guys blog. And it said it's important to not to digitize for the sake of digitizing, but rather have a clear purpose for doing so. Once you get a digitization program, it's easy to get excited. And let's digitize because we can. And you start digitizing and, and moving at a fast pace. And, and then suddenly you look back at all the things that you've done and realize that some of it you can't even use because you forgot to do metadata or the quality was bad, whatever. Many things can happen. So it, it, this is a very important thing, and and for us at the Center for Adventist Research, the Adventist Digital Library has suddenly given us a very, very clear purpose for what we're doing, and it has really helped us focus on what's important, the things that we're digitizing and how we're doing it. So that's kind of what I want to show you today. So I'm going to pretty much go over our purposes and goals that we've set up for each area of uh, material types and tell you a little bit about we, what we've done and how we're thinking and um, and then afterwards we can talk about how that's, how that's actually working. I'm also going to show you some good and bad for each of these areas of things that we've learned. So pretty much our purpose at the center is for text-based items, these are books, manuscripts, letters, that type of a thing, is to digitize to restrict access to the originals. We above all want to preserve these things. They're getting older and they probably weren't originally in, in a good condition anyway. We've come across things that are even in our vault that are enclosed in non-archival um, enclosures. Um, they're just not stored how they need to be. That type of thing, we've come across them. We're, we're trying to fix that. So our biggest um, push is to make sure that these materials stay around much longer. And that is a big thing about digitization too. A lot of people that are experts in the field are still saying, it's probably the paper stuff is going to be around longer than those digital files. So really, it, protecting the paper is, pro is going to be the biggest thing. We, um, after we digitize them, we preserve them in our vault. They're going to, they're, they will be in an area that no one has access to without director approval. And they are put in enclosures and in proper type of storage after they are digitized. We also digitize to supplement current issues and events in Adventism. 
if there's a project or general conference session, anything where we have materials that can supplement what's going on in the church, then we will also digitize those types of materials. We are focusing on the historical, the older things obviously, but we will also do this type of, of work as well. So our goal is to scan all text-based items, excluding the non-Adventist-related um, items that are already available from other resources that are not protected under copyright law. So uh, one big thing we learned was we were scanning away, just going book by book in the vault, and then we looked at it and we're like, this book is on Hattie Trust. Oh, this book's on Google Books. What are we doing? It's already available to the world. Why are we wasting our time and our equipment wear and tear on doing this? And it's not even an Adventist resource. So we stopped doing that. <laughs> um, and then copyright law, I'm sure you all are probably much more um, experts on copyright law than, than I am, but we that is something that we're, we have made mistakes at the center. We have scanned many things that we shouldn't know because we haven't been careful, we haven't been systematically looking at it and saying, why are we digitizing each item? We, need, we have started to say, why are we digitizing this item? Does it fall within our purpose and our goal of what we're doing? And part of that is also obeying the law of the land that we live in. <laughs> Um, we also are digit we plan to digitize all of our special collections that aren't covered under the no access policy. So some collections we're not allowed to digitize based on the donor. But everything that's um, open, we plan to digitize it all and hopefully make it available online at some time. Um, we want to present the digitized items to be as close to the original as possible. And I kind of said that this morning, how we scan it. We don't crop after we scan. We scan it exactly as it is it as you would have the book in your hand. We try to have that. We don't try to straighten the page. If, it, if the page falls that way where it kind of comes out, if it wasn't cut properly, all of that we're showing. The book that we have here, you can actually see what it really looks like. And all of our, and that again is because we want to close the vault. It's difficult to say, oh, here we have the digital item and someone's looking at it and they're like, but I can't tell. Why is this page bigger than the other? Or, or how did that map fold within the book? If someone has that, then we have to bring it out. So we want to, we want to limit that. And then also that all of our scanned items will be digitally available in ADL. And that's another goal that we have. So I'm just going to show you some of our standards that we've set up right now. And, and a big thing that I want to say is standards change. <laughs> You know, digital, we're in a digital world where technology is changing every day. And because of that, standards do change. We originally were scanning in 600 DPI. We've gone down to four. Um, we were not scanning in color. We scan in color now. So many things have changed in the past. And um, so right now we do, uh, we scan an item, we create an archival tip um, in the color or grayscale, depending on the and we choose to do color or grayscale based on the historical interest of the item, how old it was. Sometimes it doesn't make any difference to the end user if they see it in the true color or gray, the color of the item. So then we'll scan that in, in a fine quality grayscale. But especially in historical items, something that's old, something that's handwriting on it in different colored ink, that type of a thing, we scan it in color so people can actually see, they feel like they're holding it in their hand. A grayscale, you're not feeling, you don't have that same connection with the item. Uh, we scan it, like I say, exact replica. We try to get it exactly like it looks. We don't do cropping. Um, the 400, um, we don't compress the tip and we don't bundle them. Um, and the reason, a lot of people will, and I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with this, but a tip you can either have, so you have a 100 page document, you can have 100 tips or you can have one file and all the tips are within this bundled tip. Um, we, we unbundle them just because a lot of times we're having to access a, a page, especially with the White Data Project we do with them. Oh, page 400 is missing or page 400 doesn't open. And so that's how we've stored. Um, traditionally, we're continuing to do that because it's just easier to find something if we're looking for it than having to go into the, to the bundle tip. We create an archival PDF. I call it an archival PDF. It's j it just basically means that it's an untouched PDF. Basically, we compile those, those images into a PDF and that's all we do. We don't run OCR on it, we don't do watermarking, anything. It's just a compiled PDF of the image. 
and then that is also stored in along with the tips and that way we have our originals if you want to look at it that way um, stored in a, on a server and then we work with our files for the for access and so we create web PDFs we create an original basically the color or grayscale compiled again together into a PDF and we create a bitmap version and the bitmap again is just the plain black and white it's a very small file size and then it, it's we don't do, still we don't do cropping or anything like that you're still looking at the original scan and then prop, during the processing of the web during the OCRing and all of that it gets compressed further down to 300 dpi and then it becomes searchable we run the OCRing on it and then we also do a watermark and then the, the metadata for the item is extracted from the mark record and part of a similar process that we use um, for ADL. I take the mark record and I extract it and I put it with these files as well. So anytime I have a book and someone comes to me and says, can you send me the book, can you send me the metadata, anything, I'll have all the files in one place and be able to do that. I'm going to show you um, some of kind of hard to see. The coloring is not very good on this screen and I'm sorry. It looks really pretty here. <laughs> But these are some of our previous scans. I just want to show you an example of what we were doing in the past. Um, you can tell that this is a cover of a tract. You can tell that you, you can't see the edges. You don't know. Oh, whoops. Oh, yeah, there I am. You don't know what the condition of is the origin. We, we cropped around the edges. And I don't like that. I want to see if it was torn. What is someone's handwriting, their little handwriting up above anything? I want to know exactly what it looks like. This is a good example, and I think I can open it, yes. So we would take photographic images of the cover. We were trying to do spine photographs so that the, the people could see what the, people could see what the, the kind of a 3D type of an image of what it, what it looked like. So that's what that first image is. But then we go to the second image, and Someone who doesn't know Andrews and how things were stored is going to wonder, what am I looking at? This was a, and I don't know who did this, Froome, Froome. This is how he put put his tracks. He put them in these cardboard enclosures with the duct tape. Rarest tape. <laughs> the rarest tape, yeah. It, it, sometimes I've almost cried looking at some of these things with the duct tape all over them. <laughs> I call it duct tape. I'm sure it's not. Well, I hope. This was the advent source collection. We're talking back in the 30s, 30s 40s. Yeah. yeah, we didn't do this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, so the, the scanner, the person who was doing the digitizing, scanned this. Now, this has no bearing whatsoever to the item that is being scanned. It should not have been scanned. It has nothing to do with it. So it's an example. There's the inside cover. You can see as far down, which is interesting. But and then we get to the actual item. But again, it's been cropped down. You don't have a feel for what um, you're going through. And, and and this is standard for web books that you have page by page type of a thing. You don't really know what the track really looks like. So this is one of our um, original scans. And then currently what we do, um, and I, I'll have two here to show you, both the same book, by the way. The first one I'm going to show you, we, we do the cover, and you can see we leave a black border around it. That way you actually are looking at a picture, a photograph, as it were, of the image, of the book itself. We have our watermark down here. It's a little more muted. Um, I didn't, the boldness of it coming out, it, it distracted for me. From there, and a lot of times it covered text. So the wa I tested a lot of watermarks to decide what to do here, and I thought the light, the lighter gray, showed up better on everything. And so you can see here the the spread that we do. The book isn't yellow, by the way. It's a nice little brown on my thing. <laughs> but you can see as we go through, it's just like you're turning the page. You can tell as we get further along. It looks pretty straight. You can even tell that the staples are resting in it because we did it in color and this way. And then you can see that the staples weren't stapled straight. 
you can see the bent, how the page is starting. Well, it actually, you can't very well. You could if you could see the top there. But the page is starting to not fall correctly. And we a lot of times you have to resist the urge as you're scanning to straighten the page. <laughs> Maybe you can kind of, it's starting to come down. You can kind of see it up there. And then the end, we scan the back. And then there, there's something that will show up on the web. Now, the other thing that we're starting to, okay. the other thing we're starting to do is if we have the same book, but it was owned or had markings in it by someone of significance, then we will also scan that copy. So it's for additional, for the researchers who are interested in, in maybe, Anna, you know, Ellen White writing in the margin, like whenever Jim lets us, yeah. you know, scan his copy of the margin or whatever that book was, you know, that type of a thing. So this actually is the same book. It's, a, it's an earlier edition, but it's the same book, um, and it was a, the personal copy of E.A. Sutherland. We just got this from the Madison, the Madison um, collection. They donated it. And it's very interesting because as you go through, you see how important the subject was to him. <laughs> and you can see his markings, his notes. And this is a great example of why we scan in color, these types of things. You know, if I had scanned this in grayscale, you'd have still, still seen the markings and, the, and what he wrote, but you wouldn't have told. He had some kind of code, obviously green and red. No one knows. But maybe someone could figure it out if they were a Sutherland scholar. <laughs> so um, we will have both of these available on our website. And our metadata will obviously tell the user what the difference is between each of, between the two copies. So that is basically our text items, what we're doing right now. I'll, at the end of the presentation, I'll show you the actual scanners, the equipment we used to get these um, scans done. So periodicals, pretty much the similar process, except these ones we do crop. And the main reason that we do the cropping is because they are usually a much larger format. Like some of them we've had to turn sideways on our scanner. They're too big. To Some of them we even can't scan unless we try to do some kind of stitching because they're this big, you know, big old newspapers. So we do do the cropping. Most of the time a periodical won't have a spread across that that matters. If it does, if, if you open a magazine and it did have a spread going all the way across, then we will keep that spread so you can see it. But for the most part, we're doing the cropping there. Just be, and, and the density of the text, not the font, but the text itself, there's so much text on the page. Having a spread like that and trying to read through, it, it was. It, we tried to do it at first, and then it just, I think we need to crop these. So, so that's what we're doing. You can tell a previous scan that we did, we weren't um, as um, quality, and this is a good example of quality. You know, it's, you can still read the text, and it's OCR'd and everything, and it's OCR'd just as well as the other, but the other one just looks much more. You get a feel for the periodical, and you um, like the reading it. Yeah. So similar thing. The only difference in our processing with periodicals is in, in our catalog, the mark record is there's one for the Advent Herald. And how many, I don't know how many issues there were. But there's one mark record for that, that periodical. How do you put metadata on each issue? How do you do that? In the, you can't do it from the mark record, how it is. And so what we're doing is we, uh, we, have a, we use a Kodak software. And that software allows us to do a batch scan and then break each issue up into a document. And then each document we're going in and we're putting the metadata in for each periodical issue. So it will tell with the metadata being the title, again, the, um, the issue number, the date, the number, volume, issue, and the date. And in the future, I would really like to be able to put subject headings as well, because that's a big thing that we need to do. I mean, how are people going to, unless it's in the periodical index, which most of, I don't know if these really, really older ones are. I don't so, um, but right now, at least now, then I have for each issue of the periodical, I have a metadata file that tells me what um, what volume it is, what issue, all of that. So at least if I need to send it to someone or upload it into ADL, each issue is going to have its own record instead of just 
one mark record for each issue, which would be the, just the same data over and over again, and no one would be able to find what they're looking for. Um, photographs. Um, we have, um, that's the first thing I just believe Jim mentioned in the morning that we started digitizing. So we have over 14,000 photographs right now that we've digitized, and, and that is still something that we work on every day. Um, to me, it's the thing that I think most people want to see. Mm -hmm. To me, it's pictures. So it, it has the most interest to a general group of people. Um, our purpose is to digitize, to preserve the colors and details that are fading. We have a lot of very old photographs that you can almost not see what is in the picture anymore. And so we want to get those in, an, in a safe enclosure in our vault, the temperature control, get them processed as quickly as possible. We also digitize to initiate the restoration and preservation of photos. A lot of our photos are just in filing cabinets. Old photos. You, and we run across them all the time. Oh, there's a photo in this book or whatever. And we just find them everywhere. And we want to <coughs> make sure that they're stored and um, preserved as well. The old rolled up, you know, the long photos that are rolled up and cracked. <laughs> We're trying to figure out a way, we've done some research, trying to figure out a way to get those to flatten so we can scan them and then we can store them so that, that they will still open. Some of them we can't even open. We'll, we'll ruin them to open them, so we're not going to be able, you know, they're pretty much useless as a, a picture. And we also digitize to supplement current events or issues and to strengthen the mission of the Alex Church, which you'll see that soon. Um, our goal is to scan and preserve all photographs from the manuscript collections. That's where most of our older material resides in the vault. Donations from these people. A big example right now that we're scanning is the Uriah Smith collection that was donated by his grandson, Mark Lobey. And they had hundreds of photos of early Adventists, the Review and Herald, that type of a thing, Uriah Smith and his family. And we're now, dig that's actually one of the projects we're working on right now is getting those digitized. They've been sitting in the collection box and, um, and we, we want to get those done. And we're trying to get anything from pre-1950 going. So um, we have filing cabinet, again, like I said, they're all over. Um, we actively, and actively is the way I should have made that in bold. It's, I have personally spent over an hour on a photo identifying who the people are, where was this taken, using the clues that I see in the picture. I've read books on, on, on the different, how to tell them how old a photograph is based on like a postcard. You know they have those photo postcards? You can tell by the stamp. There's a, there's, you can tell what year it was done, or a decade at least, when, it, when the photograph was taken. So there's a lot of clues that are in photographs and actively looking at the photo and trying to figure out who the people are within it. Sometimes you have, it gets a little obsessive. <laughs> and sometimes I just had to stop myself. <laughs> um, so we do, and then we put all of that. We actually put all of our photographs in the mark record, in, our, in a catalog entry for itself. Um, we've just been doing that. That's how we've been doing it, and we are continuing to do it that way. So I do use mark um, cataloging for that, but for the people, like you saw, the unknown slash unknown and then the names, how we do that. We put that in the 505 field. Um, the 500 field we use to, sh to talk about the, the, um, the quality or the condition of the, of the actual photograph. So a lot of photographs I put that the photograph appears sepia because of aging. It's not, it was originally it was black and white, but now it's sepia. And people think it's sepia, but it really wasn't. Am I sepia? Sepia, sepia. thank you. Um, so all that, and then we use the 520 to, to create a summary because now that we're cataloging for ADL and for online access, realizing the more information we can give people who know who these, what was happening in this event, in this time period in Adventism, if someone who doesn't know this history is looking at the photograph and we say, oh yeah, uh, old metadata like this instance here, you can't really see it, but we had um, from a, the collection of John Nevis Andrew's son, was it his son? Grandson. Grandson. Grandson in China. We scanned all the photos, there were over 200 of them, and who, the person who was cataloging them used the same title for every photograph, the Andrew's family in China. Andrew's family in China. 
we have to go back because if I put all of that in ADL, it doesn't tell you anything. You know, there's a picture of a man in a mule cart, Andrew Stanley in China. <laughs> so you get the idea. <laughs> so now that we know, now that we have a purpose and, and all of that, it's it's much easier to say no. That's not acceptable. Cataloging it that way, that's not acceptable. You have to you have to take the time and do it right the first time. And then uh, again, make visually available all the photographs. So for our photographs right now, we um, do color grayscale front back depending. The front back thing is, is a dependent thing. If, for instance, a postcard, if there's um, printed data, you know, a description of what's on the front, then we do the back. If the postcard was sent and there's writing on it, we do the back. We don't, if someone later said, oh yeah, my great grandmother, whatever, we don't do the back, but we write, we type out that information in the five point field so that whoever's looking at it on the internet can say, oh, this was written on the back. If it was something that the person in the photograph wrote, sometimes we'll decide to, um, to scan the back. It depends. You just have to kind of look at each one and decide what you want, what you want to do. We use now a formula for um, what, when, what we decide the resolution of the scan photo to be. And this is because we realize that most people for uh, what we're really scanning our photographs for is for other people to use. <laughs> we're using, we're scanning so that people can use them. And how do people, how do normal people use a photo? Either they put it in their PowerPoint or they put it on their desktop or they put it on their album in their phone or they print them out. And a lot of people still print a lot of people still print these digital items and so we decided that what we're going to do is we're going to create a digital scan size that will allow people to print up to eight and a half by eleven or eight by ten so a lot of people just print these on paper on a, using a printer and so we decided the eight and a half size eight and a half by eleven size that will be our web version um, what we use to, to provide so if they decide to print our full archival PDF or archival TIFF um, image, it will print at the same resolution as the original um, at 8.5 by 11. So and that's what this formula is. <laughs> it figures that all out for us. And um, so we, every photograph we measure, we apply the formula <laughs> and that's the resolution we'll scan at. We do, however, we don't scan lower than 400 and we don't scan higher than 2400. So there's some limits, even with, with, remember the photos that we're scanning, unless you have a true negative, the photos we're scanning were already have a loss of data. They're, they were printed on paper, so there's already a loss of data from the original. So you're not gonna capture any more important detail by going higher, higher than a certain resolution. And I've done a lot of research on this and I'm definitely not an expert, but this is what we're doing right now. <laughs> Um, so then we create that archival tip and then I create through just a batch in Photoshop, I create a JPEG for the web, which is at 96 pixels per inch for the web. That's all you need to display on a screen. You don't need a 400 or 600 DPI image to just show on a screen. That, that high resolution is only used for printing. So we, the ones that are on our website, and that's why we say on our, on our photograph database that if you want to print the original, if you want to print, make sure you contact us because if you try to print these, they're gonna look terrible. And then again, we, we have an XML file that's generated from the MARC records after we've done the cataloging for the item. So you can see previously, this is this exact same picture. This is how it used to be in our database and we actually went back and rescanned it based on our new standard and you can see with this one on the left, you lost some, to me, important information. <laughs> that it was a that it was a photo card, <laughs> and the you know you've all seen those the little yeah. card things, yeah, yes. And it was done at Crystal Galleries in Battle Creek, which we've been able to date it pretty exactly. One of my student researchers did um, research on the photo the photographers in Battle Creek during the time of the the rise of Adventism, and now we know depending on the signature on a photograph, exactly the time frame for each of the pictures. 
So that was that was great research for our Battle Creek. Yes, could you publish that? Sure, no problem. Outside yeah, testing, so exactly. Those of us who also have a lot of bad boundary <laughs> photographs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. We will. And and one thing that there's a you know choosing what to digitize can be a is it subjective? Yes. <laughs> subjective decision. There's a lot of things that were digitized that I personally feel shouldn't have been. There are pictures, like I think I have a couple of examples there on the top here. The picture of a man who I don't know who he is, but it was taken from a magazine. So it was a picture from a magazine. You, can, you can't tell here, but on my picture, I can see the text from the page, the next page on the white part of the picture. And then someone also wrote, the date that they published it in the magazine on his forehead there. <laughs> and <laughs> so, you know, this is a this is a photograph in our photograph database now. And to me, this is we do not have the original of this photograph. This is not our photograph. We took it from a magazine, even though it's an Adventist magazine. And it's interesting and it's historically valuable. Is is that the only picture of this guy any of us have? then it has some value. But to me, if I had come across this picture, I would have said, oh, let's see if we can find another picture. Do we have another picture? Let's figure it out before we say, okay, this is our, this is our placeholder picture of him. And then I probably would say that in the metadata, saying we realize, we know, you can tell there's writing, you didn't just scan that because we thought it was a picture. And then the picture of the child, that was another interesting series I ran across. I'm not really sure why that got scanned. I think it was just probably in an envelope. It was in the folder. It was in the folder. It's a, a <laughs> child of someone, someone that I didn't know. But it was taken in the 80s. So this kid is only, you know, in his 20s, 30s, something like that. And so the, the, I, if this was a picture of our GC president, I could be kind of more, okay, there's a big picture. It's cute. <laughs> But not so much when we don't know who this child is and, and, and it, it kind of goes against our mission of providing information about the Adventist church, that type of thing. So those are just a couple of examples. But again, it's very subjective. Maybe someone's going to, uh, one of my students argue with me and said, hey, you know, someone doing genealogy runs across that picture and they don't have a picture, they're going to love that. So... <laughs> Uh, audio visual. <laughs> this has actually, frankly, been our biggest challenge. We started digitizing our cassettes because they were deteriorating. And um, we bought equipment, very professional equipment, very good equipment. We have great equipment. And um, we started doing it, and uh, a lot of, I'll go over what happened there. First of all, we just have <laughs> Um, so we're digitizing our audio visual items to, to preserve the deteriorating media that do not have digital counterparts available. And that has been added. That statement there has been added recently. What we failed to do was to figure out if the cassette we were digitizing hadn't already been published in DVD format or wasn't already available on the website of the speaker or anything. We weren't doing any research into that. We were just Here's the box, go for it, and digitize. Don't even, the, and the student workers weren't even looking at what they were doing. So we also are trying to create exact replica recordings of the media. We want the digitized item to sound exactly like the tape that we have, even if that tape is slow. That's the tape we have, and it may be the only tape that exists. If, you, if the person that's using it wants to go ahead and, and get our archival, um, file and speed it up, slow it down. If they know what the voice sounded like originally and they, they're willing to do that, we say go ahead. But this is how we have it in our collection. Again, preserving what we have. It's not our, to me, it's hard. You know, Dr. Burt has a very good ear for voices. He can tell, oh no, it's a little slow. And, you know, Mr. Ford and I are like, okay. <laughs> but we, you know, we don't know him. So to us, it didn't matter. But Dr. Burt says, no, I know, I know him. And it actually, what, 
the way we, a big way, there were two ways we found out that our digital recordings were bad, but the one big one for me was that I had tapes that my parents as missionaries had sent home talking about their service. And I thought, oh, I'll get, I'll record these. There's just a couple tapes, so I'll do it. And I had the student do it for me. And I took it home, and I was excited to listen. And it was like, that's not my parents. Their stuff, not their voices. It didn't sound at all like them. It was slow. It was muted. It just, it was just terrible. And I was like, oh no, uh oh. <laughs> so I go back, and then right around the same time, the White Estate had 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 us do some recordings of the tra the the interviews that Jim Nix had done, back the the interviews of all the famous people. Ellen yeah, Ellen White. Yeah, oral Alma McKibben. Yeah. The oral histories, right? Did and interview Ellen White. No. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah. If any of you have that one, we will definitely put that immediately on ADL. <laughs> so um, at the same time, the White Estate started listening to stuff we had done for them and realized the same thing at the same time. And, and it was devastating. We had done thousands of devastating to us. And we went in and tried to figure out what had happened, and basically, a few things, but a big one was that the, mach the recording equipment had never been cleaned. Mm -hmm. We had students doing the digitizing who had never seen a cassette tape. They didn't know that you needed to clean the heads, and the staff hadn't told them, or, or break, it, maybe they had, there's communication breakdowns, there's that type of thing. We have a high student turnover as well, and continue to, tr sometimes the students were training the students. And so you had that issue. Um, another issue is that we weren't um, calibrating the machines at all. Like they have, every month now, we listen, we have calibrating equipment, we figure it out, we get it back to where it needs to be. And, and sometimes our students weren't even listening to what was recording. They hit play and then they went and did whatever they were doing. And not noticing that the digital record, because we can hear them at the same time. You put it up, I can hear the recording going on at the same time, I can hear the tape what it sounds like. You can hear it, so you can tell if you're paying attention. <laughs> so many issues. So now that has been corrected and um, we're, we're slowly going back. We're, we're targeting the, the recordings that we had done in the past that, we, that don't have digital counterparts available and we're getting those up to the quality that they needed to be. So that was a big learning curve for us. Um, so we're going to digitize all our cassettes. Um, covered under the purpose statement. Again, film and VHS, we haven't started doing, and I don't know if we will. That's a, that's a big equipment. Um, you could take it to our digitization apparatus. Yeah. Our for our yeah. That's we what we're, yeah we, have, yeah, we have a lot. Um, we also digitize audio or video that will supplement that statement again and make everything available online that we can under copyright. So just, just for fun. I'm going to have you listen to the uh, recording. So this is one of our, I think the audio. Is the audio going to work? Yeah. I don't know if it's playing. That's hard to tell. Pioneer oh, okay. Memorial Church, January 12, 1974. So that was one of the ones that we had, and this is the re-recording. Vesper service in the Pioneer Memorial Church, January 12, 1974. So that is much clearer. You may actually tell who, some people may know who that guy is. From Andrew. Anyway, we um, create an archival wave file, uncompressed, obviously. And then we create a web MP3 that we can attach to the, so that people can hear it, download it to their devices, that type of a thing. And we also generate the XML from the mark record. We're also cataloging each of the recordings themselves as well. Other things we're doing is we're starting to take photographs of our artifacts, the basically the museum type things, something that, I, that we want to have in ADL is to have type of a, uh, almost like a museum walkthrough of a collection, that type of a thing, where you can actually see Uriah Smith's top hat or um, see William Miller's Bible. 
held in someone's hand how it would have looked to have someone holding up the Ellen White Bible. I don't know. <laughs> Those types of things, things that we you can't scan, but people are still interested. For me, I like my, I don't know if you know, but my degrees in art history. And so I like actually the things, the, for the correct term for it, which I don't think I can say, ephem, yeah. <laughs> and then one other fun thing we did, just to see if we could, was to, I don't know if you guys remember Mission Spotlight, mm -hmm. which I have fond memories of being a missionary kid. And um, that was like our Saturday night exciting thing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I thought, hey, we scanned slides and we digitized audio. Why couldn't we make the Mission Spotlight show? So we grabbed, um, actually we were trying to, for an, another ADL presentation, show all Jane Andrews stuff, just kind of a theme going. And so we um, did the Jane Andrews one, and then we did one on Anna Knight. And um, so, I think the audio will work here. So we pretty much <laughs> On Monday morning at the age of 19, Anna Knight entered school for the first time in her life. She slid into her desk, never taking her eyes off the teacher or the blackboard the entire morning. Sonia and Yvonne oh, read right. on and on. Yeah. Anyway, you get the idea. So, I thought that was fun. <laughs> and people, even though, I mean, I was talking to my students, and actually the student who did this for me, um, he took it and showed it at chapel at Andrews, the Anna Knight one during the Black History Month. And um, and he got a lot of great feedback. Most of it was like, uh, you guys need to review that. <laughs> Not in terms of the digitizing, but in terms of how dated it was. And But he said, you know, there's countries and people all across the world that they're not going to, Americans are going to care. Obviously, the certain generation is going to care that, oh, wow, that looks like it was made in the 70s. But people from other countries who haven't heard the story and they're still going to see pictures and people talking are going to love it. So I personally think. So we've only done two of those, and I don't know how, how quickly we'll get those done, but because they're not a high priority. But I think that they're fun. So for submitting to ADL, there's not a lot of requirements right now. Obviously, they'll, they'll, I'm sure that they will build as we go along. But right now, the thing that really caught us, uh, not by surprise, but <laughs> caught us maybe with our pants down a little bit, was that every item that comes into ADL has to have a unique ID. And however you guys want to decide that unique ID, needs, whatever it needs to be, it needs to be the same as the name of the, as the file name of the digital item. They have to match. That is the biggest requirement for ADL. So for us, we had a cat, we were naming our files by the call number of the item with underscores. So call number W11 T5. So we had W11 underscore T5 PDF. You know that was our PDF. Um, and but when we did a mark record, converted it over to XML, the call number showed up as W11 space T5. And then sometimes the sometimes there's a space between the W and the 11 in the cataloging. Sometimes the call numbers aren't all exactly the same either. And so we quickly realized that that's not going to work. So a big thing that we had to do at Andrews, and this, uh, this is an example of a little pain that we are having to go through because of ADL, but I'm willing to go through the pain because I know that in the end, everything's going to work together very nicely. We had to go through and rename all of our PDFs, all of our digital scans. We had to rename them. And we did, it was mostly automatic. There's still some guys out there that I have to fix. But most of it was automatic. What we decided to do was to name it by the bib record number. I think you guys all know what bib record number is, right? So it's the unique ID. I mean, there's a lot of unique IDs within the catalog record, or can be. But really, the bib record number, every record that's in our catalog has a bib record number. And so we decided to take that. And you can kind of, there we go. I just made one up. So there's our bib record number. Then I have an underscore. And then we have an indicator, a letter indicator, telling us what type of media it is. And it's, it's basically the code, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a librarian, but up in the mark thing, there's the item type. There's A, I, 
a picture is a, a 2D is K. Those are the codes. So it's still using the library codes within the catalog. Um, so this, I can look at this immediately and say that it's, it's a book at, or a document. And um, it is this bib record number, and it's the first one in the series of that bib record. So that is what we've had to do. And it, it's, pain, it's been painful. A lot of our links right now in our catalog broke because of it. But we're, we're quick, as quickly as possible trying to clean that up and get it going. So um, that is the big thing, figuring out what your unique ID can be and then making sure all your file names match that. And it has to be unique because all these files are going to go into one directory. So that's the other thing. A lot of our files were, because we had documents under a folder and photographs under another folder, we could have duplicate names. It didn't matter. But now with ADL, everything's going into one big pot. So we're going to have to, you know, and we may have, we may run into issues where maybe you, you guys decide to use bib record and do the same thing we're doing with exactly the same naming convention and we have the same bib record number. What's going to happen then? And that's something we'll have to figure out. <laughs> so um, so right now that's what we're doing. Uh, we also, another requirement, and I, and I probably should be, don't even have to say this because I know everyone is going to do their best, is quality. Making sure, like what we've had to do, we're re-scanning photographs, we're, we're re-recording audio, we're re-scanning some of our books. It's just not done right. And to put it out in the world, it's a, it's a, a witness. The quality of your material on the internet is also a witness to your institution. So we want it to look the best as possible. And metadata, just as much as you can. Anything you put in the catalog record, if that's how you decide to do it, or your Dublin core fields, or anything, any metadata you have about the item, where it came from, who, who originally owned it, anything that you have can be valuable for when we actually put it in the database for people to find it. Yes. The A is the item type. I'm not sure. I think it's called I type. Well, you described it sounds like an I type. Okay. You just told me to change everything to A, so I don't, didn't no, know no, what no. it was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I type. Yeah. We may have different I types for the same thing. It's fine. I what I'm doing. You don't even guys have to even do that I, at your institution. You figure out your own naming. You probably already have naming conventions. I'm just saying what we did here. This so doesn't, doesn't have to be the same for ADL. So you guys could have, have, go ahead. It doesn't have to be the bid record number. No. Because we do duplicate the bid record Right, number. it does not have to be the bid record number. It can, be in, it can be the ISBN, it can be your catalog ID or call number. It can be anything that works for your institution. This is just what worked best for us and what we were doing. So that's something to think about too as you're, as you're starting, if you're digitizing, starting to digitize that type of a thing. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be best if we had some discussions on standards so that we could uh, work on this together? Yeah. Definitely. Julie, the, the biggest thing is too is you get a unique URL and it's a permanent link to that document on the web and it's that unique ID number that shows up in the URL. And uh, if it's not unique, then you never get a duplication right. of documents, not only just in the same directory, Right. So that unique, it does, it's like she said, it's not important how it's structured, it's just important that it's unique. Right. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be, we probably very quickly need to create a working committee to work on the metadata standards. So this, well, as uh, it was created, it was named and never called to order. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that needs to be changed. In this time, to be honest, this time we need to appoint a chair who's responsible for calling meetings to order so it actually happens. Great. Yes. Oh, yes. So I just, I thought some of you might be curious. But this is actually the XML that's been converted from a MARC record into the mod, um, mod page, yeah. So um, you can see it says mod at the beginning there. And then you, I, I've kind of made arrows of the ones that have gone into ADL. You can see there's a lot more information from this catalog entry that wasn't put into ADL just because we're not 
we haven't decided if we want everything in or out or what we're doing. But this top one is, you can see the title, Madison School, and then the subtitle. So it took it from the, okay, and sorry, I might say the wrong field. The, wait, title. Two, 245. 245, right. <laughs> the 245 and then the subtitle with the delimiter. He was able to take the delimiter, recognize the delimiter, and, um, and do that. Um, then we went down to the publishing information. We, we bring in where it was published and when it was published and who published it. And those fields actually, from the question this morning about location, the publishing place will be automatically in the future in ADL. If it says Pacific Press Oakland, then it will be tagged that way. So anything that's published will be able to click on the Pacific Press Oakland and everything will come down in the list. One thing you might have noticed when Julie shows you the metadata, if wanted to, everything from the metadata record could be dumped in there. And then that becomes a searchable record that people can just look for. So what you sort out and put in your headings or your filters um, won't show up in, in, in the main document and make it look like a mess but it can be still down in the metadata section of the document. Right. So people can always see everything in the record. And that can be done in ADL. Right. Uh, we, we bring in the language because we know we have many um, items that are not in English and we want to be able to filter on that. Uh, the abstract we decided for how the cataloging has been done at Andrews, and this may not be the same for your institution, but um, the 500 and the 520 field. We had a lot of times the 500 was the only one used and, and it was used for both describing the item and the physical um, condition. It was used for everything and this is part of what I'm doing as I go in and clean up. I'm actually looking at the mark record as well and making sure that the, we don't bring in, basically for Andrews we're not bringing in the 500 field because it's talking about the, it's more talking about the actual okay, we have copy one was from the library of this person and copy four is missing, you know, page three. That type of information has nothing to do with the actual digital image that's displaying for the people on the web. It's going to be too much information for them. It's more if you're coming into Andrews and, I, oh, I do want to see that copy three missing page two. So then I know. <laughs> right. And so we are we're using the 520. That's what we're bringing in as a descriptive field for our metadata. And we put in, you know, and the 505, we also bring that in as well, because that's where we've been putting in the people and the pictures. And, um, and that's where we'll put a summary. And I try to make sure that almost every item has some kind of a summary. Some things are self-explanatory, but um, especially for the photographs, you want to have as much as possible some kind of descriptive metadata for them. And then the subject authorities, all of those are coming across even the ones that aren't marks or Library of Congress standard, is that, or is it marks standard? Is that the correct term? Okay, yeah, we've made up some subject headings. And so even those are coming through. So we have all of those coming in, and then we have the series as well. We are only using the 830 series um, to bring in. We don't use the 440? Yeah, the 490? Okay. We've done things yeah, in a certain way, and, and, and basically that's what I'm saying. You guys need to go in and see how your thing, your items are cataloged if, they're, if you're using the mark thing and figure out what fields are important for you, which fields you're using. And that's what I mean by saying every institution is going to have a different import script. You know, I don't think Loma Linda is going to be able to use ours. Stuff's going to not come through or weird stuff's going to come through. It's that type of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, mods, maps to Dublin Core and to mark. So, right. Yeah. yeah. There's no problem getting whatever, however you have your data, we're going to figure it out and get it in. So, yeah. And then at the bottom, you can see the record identifier at the bottom there. That is the field that tells ADL what the unique ID is. And I, I'm in actually entering that into each catalog record that we have because it's not there. And we can automatically, do, we could probably write a script to do that. Right now, I'm just manually doing it trying to get used to all the things that I need to look for. So um, it's been a good experience for me going in and correcting some of these records to make them clean them up and make them ready to go into ADL and realizing that they, the type of data we're missing in some records that's valuable 
for um, people trying to find it in a non-library catalog um, world. And so just a few lessons learned that we've learned is don't trust just anyone to digitize. <laughs> and this, this brings us around. At Andrews, we have a student worker model. And we have had ever since we had digitization. And it, it's, a, it's a hard one to have. There's a high turnaround. Uh, you hire someone based on what they look like on paper, and sometimes they get in there and you're like, you're not allowed to touch anything. <laughs> 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 Let's see what other jobs we can find for you. You just you have to learn as you go. And finding, even and probably the same thing applies for finding a staff person. I mean, I've seen some staff, uh, even in our center, are better at handling older things than others. It's just, there's some, and, and maybe we just need to all find librarians. Because I think all of us probably can't, I'm not a librarian, so I said us, but I'm sorry. All of you probably handle things much more reverently than the average everyday person would, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I've discovered. Watch, there's been times when I've, I've almost started crying and had to run over to one of my students and say, drop it, stop touching it. And it's someone that I trusted. You know, and just they just don't have the same the same reverence. That's the word I have to use. The same reverence for the thing that they're holding. Um, and I, but then sometimes you find a student there. It's like someone sent from heaven. I had someone, and he had actually worked his whole life before coming before becoming a minister in a a preservation in Brazil, a preservation company. He knew more than you know besides probably Dr. Burt, anything that any of us knew. And he's, he's just changed everything that we've done, how we handle things, what we're doing. He said, oh no, this type of book needs to be in this kind of enclosure. And have you thought about putting this in here? And he was just, yes, do it. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> and, and, he, and he also, he's also a, a studying to become a minister. And I, I let him scan William Miller's Bible. And he, he told me later that at the end he was crying. Yeah. He couldn't believe that he had been allowed. The priv to him, it was the privilege of being able to hold this, this Adventist artifact mm -hmm. and to be the one. He, and now he knows that anywhere he goes in the world, he's going to be able to see that work that he did mm -hmm. on that screen. And everyone in the world, it's just, it, was so, it was so emotional for him. And so you find those rare gems. <laughs> and even me, I've cried touching thing. It's you just you rent my crying is different. For me it's more the story of the people. We have a collection if I may for a minute. <laughs> we have a collection John Peter Anderson. He was a missionary in China and he was in a, a Japanese internment camp and he wrote letters almost every day to his wife. But he couldn't send them. So it was a diary but it was in form of letters to his wife. And we have this collection, handwritten letters, year after year of being in this camp. He kept track of everything. He had the weight of all the, of all the people in the camp. He kept track of everyone's weight. He kept track of which, oh, this guard, I think something's going on with him and his wife. He's been really grumpy today. <laughs> this kind of thing. It was, it's hilarious, you know? And talking about the interactions that they all had with each other in the camp, it's a great resource for someone studying some, studying pe a group of people with, in a, in you know, prisoners. It's a great resource, but at the end, there was, he had saved the um, little pieces of paper that the U.S. military dropped from the planes, telling the prisoners to not lose hope, the war was almost over. Mm -hmm. He had saved those and pasted them in. And I got to those, and I'm like, yeah, that was <laughs> <laughs> so, so to me, it was just, the, this, this whole story of this man, this, this, this year period, and it's been sitting in our vault. And unless you know it's there or you're just browsing our finding aids, no one knows it's there. Mm -hmm. It got digitized. <laughs> it will be there. <laughs> so, yeah. So, for me, this, that, so everyone has a, an item mm -hmm. or an area or whatever that they're passionate about. And that's the beauty of all of us. Dr. Burt, interested in things. Jen's interested in things. And all, all of us are interested in different things. And we bring things out based on our personalities and things we're interested in. So the collaboration between us has really helped enrich what we've decided to digitize as well. So yeah, the students, um, 
we've learned that everything has to be looked at. Everything before final, before we say that's done. I have in a database, I keep track of everything I assign. I assign tasks to students, everything. There's a, a final check mark that only I can do. And that's me actually physically looking at everything they've done and saying, yes, that's done, go on to the next task. And that's what we've learned we've had to do because the students don't have, most of them don't have the same level of passion for the things that they're handling and for, the, and for digitizing as well. So projects must fall under set goals, have clear deliverables and a time limit. I'm sure we all know this. And so a lot of times we've gotten bogged down in digitization projects that maybe we shouldn't have started in the first place or maybe didn't have the same priority as something else we should have done. And the timeline wasn't clearly defined or the deliverable or whatever. We've had to go back and rescan or rush <laughs> to get something done. A lot That's happened to us a lot. It's like, oh wait, they wanted it that way? And then rush, 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 you know? And so we're trying to develop more processes and procedures to make sure that things flow much more smoothly and don't cause us too much stress. And again, the, the statement that not everything deserves to be digitized. Looking at each item and saying, really? Is this something that I need to spend my time on? And digitization is expensive, as you probably all know. Equipment and time and the storage of those digital images. Assessing everything and saying, is this worth digitizing? Is this something that's important enough that I need to take all this resource to do? And then change happens constantly. The standards continually need reassessment. We've, I mean, looking at the, the processes and procedures document. It keeps changing almost every month, depending on new things we've learned, things that we've learned from our mistakes or new standards, that type of a thing. And the new goals have changed our processes. ADL has completely changed everything that we're doing in the center. It's going to change our staffing model. It's going to change how we use our student workers. Everything's changing. So and being willing to accept that change and say, hey, is what we got to do to keep re relevant and keep going forward. And then it's expensive, which I'm sure we all know. <laughs> so um, we have to, the storage space being the big one, we're still struggling. We have a lot of data. And where are we going to put it? And what's the best what, What's the best thing to do? And luckily, we have an IT department that's been recently very nice to us. So um, just to, if any of you are curious, this is the equipment, the, some of the major equipment we have. We have two Kodak sheet fed scanners, so it's like a copy machine type of a thing. You put a page in, it whips through, scans both sides at the same time, and the software is very, very robust. It's able to take that OCR it, put it in a PDF, send the TIFFs there, send the PDF there. It, the software is great for these, these scanners. And it's expensive. <laughs> so that's the one up here. This one right here, it looks like this. Uh, we use that for scanning letters. It's actually, the, we have two versions of it. The I-4200 is also very, um, it can take very fragile items. We're scared to test it. <laughs> but if you go slow enough and you make sure it's straight, it can take, if I scanned a little newspaper article that big, it was able to take it through. I scanned a, the onion skin. I've done a lot of testing with it. You have to be careful, don't get me wrong. And there have been times that something's been caught and we've had to repair it. But for the most part, it's been a great, a great thing. Um, the Invis 9000 is our latest um, paper scanner. Uh, it has a piece of glass that you lift up. The cradle that you see, it looks completely flat, but it's actually two panels like this on, on um, springs. And they can move back and forth to cradle. The, you can put the spine between the panels. And that way, you can have the spine in the middle, the paper is down and pressed down, and it doesn't hurt the spine at all. And so it's been very helpful for scanning the items that we don't want to crop, so don't want to cut, and and not harm the the um, items. And then the the camera goes across, does a pass across, scans the image, it displays on the computer on the side, then you can you go the next, next, next. It's not automatic. Actually, you have to hit a foot button to scan each page. But um, it's a more reasonably priced solution. For our photographs, we're using the Epson, our old Epson Expression 1000 XL, which, and the Epson V700. And I, w I, w I felt really good because I went to the Library of Congress and they listed their equipment and they were using the same thing. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it made me happy. <laughs> so um, the Epson V700 
is actually a new scanner that recently came out and it's great. We, I did the glass slide, the um, what was the? lantern slides. I did the lantern slides on that and I just tested to make sure that it would work well and, and, and bring those on and it's a beautiful, beautiful image. Uh, they, it has the optical density up to four, which is the highest it can be, and that's what you need to look for in a photograph scanner is optical de density. Um, resolution matters, but not as much as that. The optical density will actually pick up the detail in the picture. And then the Epson, the expression is a larger bed, but it's getting, it's getting a little old, it's slow, but it's still a very, very good scanner. So. Um, the, this is our major equipment. We have the deck of cassette um, recording, that type of a thing as well, but um, this is basically the bulk of what we do right here. So, um, and that's all I have. So, um, so. The next item on the program is a question answer time. This will be time to ask uh, Merlin, Julie, Dave, 